But, uh, and thanks for coming. That song uh, was released in 1979. Anybody remember what they were doing in 1979? <laughs> Is that true? Wouldn't it be ironic, the irony of that? I was in college. And, uh, you know, I could identify with some of the message of that song because, you know, when you're in college, you have to take exams. And uh, I remember stressing, I mean, this stressing over exams. Maybe you were a parent at that time. <laughs> Maybe this song came out and your son or daughter liked it and you're stressing as a parent going, oh, I don't like this kind of music, uh, you know? I mean, this stress, this stress, this song was about distress, crying out for help, sending out a message in the bottle. That's the word picture that was given through the lyrics of that song. Someone all alone, standing on a beach on a desert island, crying out for help, needing something, needing a response in some way. This particular song was talking about loneliness. And then they, they were not lonely, though, in their loneliness, they found out. They walked out to the beach and saw on the shore, what, a hundred billion bottles. Now, that's a song. I can't believe that they actually knew that there was a hundred billion bottles. Think about it. But think about 7.7 .7 billion people in our world today. It's the current population, they say. And that many people, I'm sure, sending out a message of, of crisis or, or desiring to have something come back to them to provide hope. Why? Because they're in a hopeless situation. Many of them. That song talked about, I hope someone gets my message. I mean, that hope. We sang about that, though. I love that last song that we sang together. Jesus Christ is the what? Ah, Jesus Christ is the living hope. Where did they send the bottle, or, or, or where did they send the message out to? You hear that in the song? The world. The world got the message. You know, SOS is an international code, code signaling extreme distress. It's an urgent appeal for help. Sounds like this. Heard that before? It also looks like this. Some people write it in the snow. Some people need it written in the snow. If you look at this next slide, you know, I don't know how they did that, you know, flying through the air, scribbled it, and then disappeared. But then they're, they need help, you know. They're buried down there with the glove, but they have hope because what? They have a cell phone. They can call for help. <laughs> Right. And then next is, you know, because they called 911, thumbs up. They're doing good. You also see this message of SOS written on a beach sometimes, right? And it's an interesting uh, group of letters that they chose to write because even upside down, what do you spell? SOS. SOS is an urgent call, an urgent call for help. Two weeks ago, Patrick Vu mentioned that the meaning that he was kind of working with was being overextended or be depleted as a person. He talked about time. Last week, Bob Cameron talked about worry and how he can be an overdraft with worry and what that, how that can affect us. But for tonight, or today, we're talking about relationships and uh, that's a worldwide problem, right? It's, it's an international message, that SOS, and it, because this issue of relational overdraft is an international problem. All around the world, people are having to deal with the fact that their lives are not in good shape. I mean, it can mean that your life is out of balance and it's unbalanced or it's off-balanced. It can mean that your life has gone off the rails, and you need to get back on track. It can mean that one's life has been affected by a baby crying, right? Feed me! <laughs> Hold me! 
change me, you know, or, or a child, you know, yelling and screaming. I was reminded of, as I was thinking about this message, about a 10-year-old boy, myself and my friend Mike, at his house playing on a summer day and we're looking for stuff to do. We thought it would be cool. What, what wouldn't be cool about climbing in the trunk of the car of his parents, you know, and then closing it? You know, that's cool, you know, and then we got in there and it's dark and we can't get out. And we're yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming as a child for help. His sister showed up with the keys and opened the door, the, the trunk. It could be an adult in a situation where they're having difficulty and they're searching or a spouse struggling or a, or a parent praying, you know, shows up in many different forms, SOS. It can be sent out in many different ways. And it's with that framework that I want us to look at two questions. I want to kind of address two questions this morning. The first question is this. Why do people find themselves in such distress that they send out an SOS? Amen. Why do people find themselves in such distress that they have to send out an SOS? First question. Second question is, how do we guard against or recover from that crisis, that situation, that relational overdraft that we find ourselves in? We will look at how relational overdraft affects not only our horizontal relationships, but he also relate, it affects our relationship vertically with God this morning. And be, just before we dive into some specifics in the Word of God, I'm going to ask that you join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that uh, you create every day. You allow us to live through every day. You allow us to choose. We allow us to live in freedom or live in bondage. We, you, you allow us Father, we allow us to come here to worship you, to learn about you, to be with people who love you, even to search for you, and even be transformed by you, Lord. And I pray that this morning you would speak. You would meet each one of us where, right, right where we're at. You know where we're at. You know what we need. I pray that you would minister to us. Show yourself to us by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So why do we find ourselves in relation to overdraft? Galatians, we're going to stick in Galatians and go to some other scriptures. I'm going to ask you to follow along. You can follow along the Bible in front of you, your own Bible. You can follow along on your smartphone. You can follow along right up on the screen. But we are going to read a number of scriptures that I'm going to be commenting on. And I'm going to tie this all together. But we're going to start with Galatians 5, 7, and it says, You were getting along so well, who interfered with you to hold you back from following the truth? You are getting along so well. Who interfered? Other translations say, who has cut in on you? Who has hindered you? Who made you turn from? Who has stopped you from? Or who has held you back? Who is it? Well, the Galatians were experiencing uh, an issue that had to do with something that maybe is not so pertinent today as far as an issue in the church and that, but it was about circumstances, or, or circumcision. Circumcision or uncircumcision, to do or to not do. To find yourself following the law or living by grace. It has a lot to do with the, the three-part series that Chuck spoke about in January about choosing to live in bondage or in freedom, right? They were wrestling through that whole topic. Today, our specific issue may not have to do with circumcision or uncircumcision, but we still have to decide how we're going to respond, how we're going to live, whether it's by the law and the letter of the law or by the grace that it's and extended to us by God. Why do people need to, why do people need to trust in that grace? Why do people need to believe in that grace? Why do we need to be guarded against falling into living by the law? 
Well, it's because it affects our relationships. The reality is our lives end up in relation to overdraft in some form or another. We become out of balance, messed up, whacked out, off base. And this morning what I want to do is I want to focus on three reasons why we find ourselves in overdraft. What are the three reasons, the three overarching reasons we find ourselves in relational overdraft? Why do we find ourselves so distressed? And actually it comes from Galatians 5, 7, where it talks about something interferes with us and why I end up in this distress, but it comes in a form of an acronym, S-O-S, S-O-S. And the first S of S-O-S is sin nature. Sin nature. Think about it. Life is going good, right? All is good. When life is going good, guys go, ah, life is good. But then things start to change. Stress starts to build and worry, and all of a sudden things aren't so good anymore. Galatians 5, 13 to 15 tells us what kind of cuts in, what kind of makes us fall into this trap of, of a relational overdraft and gives us some specific reasons why we do this. It says in verse 13, for you have been called to live in freedom. Isn't that great? We're called to live in freedom. Not freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but freedom to serve one another and love one another. For the whole law can be summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But instead of showing love among yourself, you are always biting and devouring one another. Watch out. Beware of destroying one another. I mean, that's a real messed up relationship, right? Biting, devouring, destroying. And lives are like that. Maybe your life is in that place right now. See, our sin nature causes us to experience that. That's one of the reasons. Paul goes on to write in Galatians 5, 17. It says, the old sin nature loves to do evil, but, which is just the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us the desire that, is, that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, get that, these two forces are constantly fighting each other and are Choices are never free from this conflict. That's the inner battle. That's the sin nature. That's the struggle. When you follow the, sin, the desires of the sin nature, your lives will produce these evil results. And this is a list. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activity, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, divisions. I caught this one. The feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your little group. I grew up in the church, and, you know, that can be a real problem in the church. Out in the foyer, going to brunch, having your little discussions about everything that's wrong, and you're all in agreement, and you're saying, hey, they got to get it right in here or whatever, goes on to say, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. All of these contribute to what? Relational overdraft. See, the Galatians were having a struggle because of the, their sin nature. They were having a struggle with their freedom that was to serve one another and love one another, but then they were drawn back into their kind of their old self and their, what was going on in the past and they were trying to be led to be living by the law. Somebody was kind of interfering with this new direction that they were going in. We, in our present fallen state, after Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, we experienced the same struggle. See, we have the opportunity to serve one another and love one another and have relationships that are right, but we end up doing what? mistreating others. This is all due to our struggle that exists between the sin nature, which we're born with, and the Holy Spirit that indwells us when we trust in Jesus as our personal Savior. We're born with this sin. 
Romans 5.12 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. There was no sin. Adam and Eve sinned. And when he sinned, it was passed on to the whole human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Because one person disobeyed God, many people became sinners. See, we're not born without sin. I know that's purported out there. We're not born with a blank slate. It's not dependent. Sin doesn't enter our life when we have our first poopy diaper or we pee on our parent or anything like that or we do something wrong. We're born with it. We enter the world with it. And we have this sin nature, this inner struggle. The Apostle Paul, he had that struggle. He, he confessed that. He wrote a letter to the Romans, the people living in Rome with the, 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 the church there. And he said these words. The law is good then. The trouble is not with the law, but with me. Because I am sold into slavery with sin as my master. Get this. I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Ever have that tension? Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I am doing is wrong, and my bad conscience shows that I agree with the law, that the law is good. But I can't help myself because it is sin inside me that makes me do these evil things. He says, now, this is not a healthy mindset. He says, I know I am rotten through and through, so far as my old sin nature is true. But it is true. No matter which way I turn, he says, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. When I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. But if I am doing what I don't want to do, I'm really not the one doing it. And he's not blaming somebody else. He's just identifying the, the problem. It is sin within me that's doing it. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what, I, what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law, he says, with all my heart. But there is another law at work within me that is at war with my mind. This law wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. He goes on, oh, what a miserable person I am who will free me. He asks the question, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? That's a terrible place to be, but that's what our sin nature can do to us. And I love the last verse, verse 25, because here's the good news. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Who's the answer in? Jesus. Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see, it is, see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. And we start to wrestle with these things, and why do we do these things that we don't want to do, and why do we don't do the things that we want to do, and you know, we find ourselves just in just little things. I experience a lot of this when I'm in a car driving. Most of the time when I'm alone, but sometimes somebody's there to witness some of this struggle. Usually it's my wife, Hanukkah. Drive into McDonald's, the one on Manning Road, right by our house. I drive in, there's through the drive through, you can you have a decision to make and go straight or you can go to the other one. There's two places to place your order. And you want to get your coffee or whatever, especially now, it's only a buck, so you go in there, you want to get in there fast, you want to go through the drive through fast. And, you know, my selfish nature says, hey, I want to get maybe leapfrogged over that person in front of me, you know. And then my anger outburst comes when that other person leapfrogs over me. Right? It happens all the time. We are a border town city. We live close. We go across the border, right? We have to wait in line. We think, we hope, we pick the best line. <laughs> and then we see these other guards going there, and they're going there, and you're sitting there, you know. And then you get into a situation, your competitive edge comes out, and I've got to beat that car. And why is that? Well, part is because of our sin nature. We're born that way. And so there's that wrestle within us. 
See, the Apostle Paul had that sin nature too. And his writings that God used him to write are a gift to us to read and to learn about God and how to live our life. But I got to believe that Paul, you know, he must have yelled at the refs at the gladiator competitions or something like that. He got that call wrong or something like that. But he wrestled with this stuff in his life. We wrestle with this stuff in our life, and it's our sin nature that affects us. We are not free of its influence when we become a follower of Jesus Christ. We still have to deal with this issue. So when we sense or feel that relational overdraft is present in our life, it can be due to sin nature. The second letter, O, stands for others or other things. Others or other things. Going back to Galatians and some verses following. You are getting along so well. Who has interfered with you to hold you back from following the truth? They're trying to follow the truth. They're trying to do what's right, live, with, live in a way that's right. It certainly isn't God. So let's make that clear. It's not God. It's our sin nature and it's others and other things. For he is the one, God is the one who called us into freedom not into bondage, but it takes only one wrong person among you to infect all the others. A little yeast spreads quickly through the whole batch of dough. I am trusting the Lord to bring you back to believing as I do about these things, to live in grace, not under the law, to live in freedom, not in slavery. God will judge that person, whoever it is, who has been troubling or confusing you. See, it's not just our sin nature, but it's others and other things that get in the way and mess up our life and mess up our relationships. The Galatians were doing fine. Somebody affected them. Somebody infected them, right? Doesn't identify who it was. They were influenced to the point where their walk with God was affected. That relationship, the vertical relationship was affected. And that's what happens with us. Someone or something influences us and it wrecks our relationship with God and in turn it wrecks our relationships with one another. Leading to relational overdraft. 1 John 2, another verse, passage. 15 to 17 says, Stop loving the evil world and all that it offers you. For when you love the world, you should do you, you show that you do not have the love of the Father in you. Wow. It's pretty tough words to swallow. In a way, of, that's a form of idolatry, right? And that was listed in the previous verses. It goes on to say, for the world offers only three things, generally. The lust of physical pleasure, the lust of everything we see, and the pride in our possessions. These are not from the Father. They are from this evil world. And this world is fading away, along with everything it craves. But if you do the will of God, you will live forever. See, people around us may say something or do something that we are influenced by, and it causes us to move in the direction of overdraft. Everybody has a Jones. Everybody has a Jones that we aspire to be like. You know, I, I looked it up. Where do you look? You, you Google it and say, you know, that phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, came from a comic strip. Ran from 1913 to 1940. It's called Keeping Up with the Joneses. It was all about this family called the, the McGinnis family that struggled to keep up with their neighbor. They were the Joneses. We have that problem today. Others or other things interfere with our walk with God, our search for the truth, and we end up in relational overdraft. Third, the second S refers to Satan or the source. Satan or the source. See, he's the master deceiver. He's the father of lies. He had been in the world before man was recreated, had a lot of opportunity to, to craft his trade. Besides, I'm going to put on my serpent suit and costume, 
and he goes to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 1, or chapter 3, it says this. Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the creatures the Lord God had made. It's interesting that Satan, he chose to be covered by a serpent. You know, to enter a serpent. The shrewdness, craftiness. And he's, we're kind of entering into a conversation that Adam or Eve was having with, with the devil. And he says, really? He asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? And she says, of course we may eat it. It's only the fruit from the tree in the center of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat it or even touch it, or we will die. You won't die, the serpent hissed. God knows your, that your eyes will be opened when you eat it. You will become just like God, knowing everything, both good and evil. The woman was convinced. The fruit looked so fresh and delicious, and it would make her wise. There it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. So she ate some of the fruit, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Now get that. It wasn't like he was off somewhere in the back 40 doing something. He was right next there. He allowed her to do that. He didn't jump in and stop her. He's just as guilty. Can't blame her. He ate too. And at that moment, boom, his eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. They strung fig leaves together around their hips to cover themselves. And there the fashion industry all began. The reason for our inner struggle and our difficulty with being influenced negatively has to do with our sin nature, others and other things, and the root. Satan, the source. He wants to destroy every relationship. That's his goal. He's out to destroy every single relationship. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, Be careful. Watch out for the attacks of the devil. Why? Because he's our enemy. And he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. He wants to pounce on us as a person and mess up our life so we can mess up relationships. And he's alive and well doing that in many lives today. He wrecked Adam and Eve's relationship, right? I mean, they were... They were in the Garden of Eden. They were living with no sin. I mean, they could eat anything but just, little, just a, two trees they couldn't touch. Life had to have been good, right? They were doing something that was interesting. You know, they felt their shame and their nakedness, and they hid. And when God came looking for them, he says, who told you that we were naked? Now, we don't know, understand that question, this side of the fall. You know, if we see two naked people, man and woman, in the garden running around, we're going to notice that, right? But they were living in this innocence, no sin period, no shame at all, and they entered in after their decision to disobey God and eat the fruit, sin entered their life, and they shame. And the story goes on, blame. Because when God asked them about it, she blamed the serpent. And Adam blamed Eve and, you know, not taking responsibility. And God made that problem go away in a sense. He, he made it right. He redeemed the situation. But Satan was the source. And he is the source today. Three letters. S-O-S. An overarching view of what is it that infects us, affects us personally in our relationships with God and our relationships individually. It's our sin nature. It's others or other things. And it's the devil. Second question. You're looking, it's 11 o'clock. It's only a second question. Well, we've been getting complaints that we're ending too early. Can you believe that? <laughs> so you need to start complaining about, hey, we need to keep ending early. So I'm going a little longer today. 
How do we, the second question, how do we guard against or recover from relational overdraft? And I won't take so long to answer that question. Because I don't think we have to take a long time to answer that question. But it can be difficult, the process. The first is we have to understand the root cause. We have to understand SOS is the root cause. When we identify that and understand that, that can help us guard against and recover from a relational mess in a bad situation, a time of distress. That's number one. Number two, we need to seek God. Well, that's I'm supposed to tell that in church. But we, we have to pray and read the word. I left my Bible down there. I, I feel comfortable carrying it because you know, I depend on that. Because I depend on the one that it's written about. Not because I depend on a bound book, but I depend on Jesus, you know, who's alive today, right? And I depend on him. We have to depend on him. So we pray. We send up that SOS. And we read scripture and we can get to know God through his word. Galatians 5, 22 to 26 that chapter ends with these words. It says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Now think about it. It's about control. Who's in control of our life? It's in nature, others, other things, the devil, or the Holy Spirit? And he gives a list, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucify them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You get that? It said, not just part of our lives, but in every part of our lives. There's the challenge because of temptations and things that we face and because of our human nature. Goes on to say, let us not become conceited or irritate one another or be jealous one another. There's that list, part of that list. So we need to understand the root cause. We need to pray and read the Bible and study and learn from the living word. We need to, third, look at ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. We need to look out the window, not, we need to look in the mirror, not just out the window, as the phrase goes. Get that? We need to look at, when we're pointing the finger, you've heard this before, that they're pointed, more are pointing back at us. We need to do ourselves a favor. We need to be honest with ourselves. This honestly will perpetuate the problem. Honesty with ourselves, with God's help, will help us overcome that struggle that we're having with God and with others in our relational distress and overdraft. So look at ourselves, self-examination. Four, talk to the person or people who are being impacted. In other words, this is the one who you're having problems with. These are the people that you're struggling with. Talk to them. Call them up, text them, email them, send them a letter. Meet with them face to face. Five, talk to the right or correct outside source for help. Let's say your life is so messed up and your relationship is so messed up and you want to make it right. Speak to a trusted and respected friend. And if you need to, seek professional help. When it comes to relationships, we have a choice. And we can go in this direction, and we can go in this direction. And basically, I just want to review two lists. One direction is this. We read it already. It's all out there. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, but it's a list that includes some of the things we battle with and we struggle with. We can go in that direction, or we can go in another direction. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Not an exhaustive list, but it's a fruit of the Spirit. And let me tell you, would you agree that those nine 
would help us in our relationships? I mean, if we do one of those nine, it would begin to help us in our relationships. So we have a choice of what direction we're going to go. So my question is, who is your relational struggle with today? Who are you struggling with? What is your relational struggle? How are you experiencing this relational overdraft? If you're standing on the shores of Lake Sinclair or some ocean somewhere, what SOS would you cry out with? There can be many struggles we face in our relationships. Your struggle may be with a spouse, Backing up, it may be just within yourself, that battle, or with a spouse. It may be a boss or an employee or an associate. It may be a relative, like a parent or a child or a grandparent. Maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, maybe God. Your struggle may be one or more of many different things. It could be loneliness or lust or selfishness or pride or jealousy, envy or anger. Whoever your struggle is with and whatever your struggle is, please remember this. There is hope. We sang about it. Jesus Christ is the what? Living hope. And he truly is. God loves you. God loves us. God cares about us. He has the best for us. He wants the best for us. Don't only send your SOS to the world, as that song said. Send your SOS to God, Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you'd like to talk to somebody or pray with somebody, I'd like to just invite you to come down front. I'll be here. Some others would be here, men and women. And if you just want to talk or pray, I encourage you to do that. I also want to encourage you to do this. Um, if there's a way that we can help you with what we offer here, it's in the bulletin or on our website or whatever, get on board with some of the things. Come to the family state with your family. Come out to Grief Share starting a week from tomorrow if you're struggling with loss. Come out to Divorce Care. It's Monday nights if you're struggling with divorce. Invest in your upcoming marriage, April 5th and 6th, when you have marital expectations. We at Lakeshore want to serve you. Our staff want to serve you. Our leaders want to serve you. Our people, we want to serve you. So respond. Move in the direction that will help you and not hurt you so that you can avoid and guard against this relational overdraft. Please join me in prayer. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your goodness. You are good, Lord. We sang about that. Thank you for even in the bad times, you are still good. Thank you that we can depend on you. We can lean hard on you. Give us your wisdom and discernment and direction on what we need to do as our next steps, Lord, and what we're struggling with with time, with worry, with relationships, whatever it may be. Help us, Lord. We want to depend on you and look forward to seeing how you answer our prayers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.